Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, here we are for the final session of the conference. It's only uh, us standing between you and going home. Um, but uh, I think we will have an interesting debate. Um, I, I'm Mike Colchin. Uh, I'm a member of the UK Advisory Board. And I also chair the Scientific Advisory Committee for the UKRI Energy Programme. Um, my job this afternoon is just to uh, make sure a good debate happens. Um, to start that off, we're going to have uh, Rob, who's uh, going to talk to us uh, for a few minutes, reflecting on, yes, the government's net near zero strategy, but also on what he's heard over the last two days. Um, the last two days obviously have been based around that strategy and lots of different people's responses to different aspects of it. Um, and this afternoon, we want to look at that more and reflect more on that, but also start to think about, and what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? We've been all about sort of how we, uh, we address that implementation gap. So where do we go from, from here? And that's part of what we want to look at this afternoon. We are going to be joined um, after Rob has spoken by a panel, um, but I will introduce them at the time because uh, two, of them, two of them are going to be online. So, uh, but uh, that, more to come, um, but over to Rob. OK, uh, thanks very much. Um, before I start, I'm just going to do a very quick uh, request stroke housekeeping point uh, regarding uh, the kind of data that we're trying to gather on EDI, which Gaia is going to quickly stand up and speak to. Yeah. Um, monitor the effects of them for our EDI strategy. So I'd be really grateful if you could do that. I just send you an email. <laughs> okay, thank, thanks, Gaia. It is, I know that it seems kind of boring or, or not very necessary, but unless we can baseline this stuff, we can't, uh, we can't take stock of how, how well we're doing and we can't improve. So thank you for, uh, in advance for filling the form in. Um, yeah, so my, my brief uh, for, for this afternoon uh, was to talk about was to take was to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of uh, of the net zero strategy, and I've kind of taken that brief and slightly sort of run with it and changed it so that I could talk about what's happening uh, through the course of the um, the last couple of days. And I, I won't I won't thank them all now, but I mean I'm sure you all agree it's been very very good uh, in terms of the organisation and uh, the the guys doing the clever things with Glissa and, uh, and the substance. Um, so what I've been doing is taking notes in big enough handwriting that in theory I can read them without taking my glasses off. Uh, that, may or may not, uh, that may or may not work. Uh, and obviously that means that I've got it written down in the wrong order, so I'll sort of be incompetently flickering around between uh, um, uh, pieces of paper. Um, but I thought I'd just to start from the strengths and weaknesses of the net zero strategy and then basically run through session by session and make a few observations. I couldn't make it to all of the sessions because some of them were running at the same time as each other, which is slightly unfortunate. So I missed one of the ones this afternoon. So um, John Baratetal, I apologise uh, because you'll be absent from this, but perhaps we can pick that up um, in questions. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind um, with regards to the, to the net zero strategy was the old... I think it's a Monty Python sketch. What did the Romans ever do for us? Okay, so, you know, well, what about, you know, roads? And what about, you know, you get the idea. The point there is we actually have a net zero strategy. Uh, we have a, uh, a net zero commitment. And it's, it, it, that is not uh, a given uh, in the political context that we're in. Uh, we have a... Uh, we've had a government that was quite antagonistic to green stuff uh, when it first came to uh, majority uh, administration in 2015. Uh, we've then had uh, a kind of populist, uh, uh, kind of the Brexit agenda and a, and a kind of populist context. And throughout that, for all of its limitations, which I will not overlook and will come back to, we still have a net zero strategy. And even in the context of the uh, of, of what we've been through with COVID, what we're seeing now at the moment with the war um, and the impact on, on the price of gas in particular, which is then, and, 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 and transport fuels, uh, which of course then sets the price of electricity, which isn't necessarily, doesn't have to be so. Read our report on a pot zero CFD for how you might 
get some cheaper uh, renewables and nuclear through to end consumers. Um, and so we've got the strategy that wasn't, and it will continue to be, be politically contested. We're seeing that political contestation on the extreme, I say extreme right, I mean, that's obviously a perspective that I have, but on the kind of GB News, Nigel Farage end of the spectrum, um, it's, it's, it's being very, you know, uh, contested. And Andy Burnham was making some really important points, I thought, yesterday about the importance, in his context, of having had sort of, you know, very big pushback against policy that he was trying to implement in this city to reduce uh, local air pollution, that you need to bring uh, people along with you. And there's a whole wide range of views out there in, in our country and in the wider world, uh, people that don't think like the majority of the people think in this room. So there's a, we need to be careful to guard against groupthink, um, and we need to kind of think about how we you know, push the aspirations forward uh, for net zero, but with full cognizance of that and evidence and the kind of social science um, that sits around that. So we have um, the net zero strategy. That's a kind of umbrella. Um, then we have all of the various different uh, individual strategy documents uh, for bits of uh, for transport, whether it's industrial decarbonisation uh, and the rest of it, um, that were all launched last year in the run-up to COP. Um, they're all flawed. Some are more flawed than others. Um, and we can pick up on that and come back to some of that. In some parts of the system, we have concrete policies that are quite that are have been proven to be a success. And the most obvious of those is the contract for difference uh, scheme, which is, has, has been driving cost reductions and deployment uh, of large-scale renewables uh, predominantly. Now, the, the continued existence of that in the longer term is open to question because we have the review of electricity market arrangements, which Bayes uh, is, 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 is doing now. They're running a consult, well, they will be running a consultation this summer. We are close to that conversation. We are absolutely, as you, Kirk, in that conversation in the room uh, and arguing primarily for a, a for pragmatic uh, policy. Uh, and pragmatism, I think, is... Uh, there's a very wide, broad church of, of opinion on many things in this consortium, and there has been throughout the 20-odd years that it's been in existence. Uh, but pragmatism has always been a kind of a, a primary uh, principle for all of us, at least I like to think so. Um, we, we, we know that we have a lack of policy in, in, in the kind of energy efficiency space. It wasn't absent from the rhetoric in the, um, in the British energy strategy. I think it's very important to, uh, to emphasise that. It's just that was, there was only, only rhetoric and a VAT cut and a new website on energy efficiency, which really uh, doesn't really get you very far uh, along the road to what you might hope to achieve. But even what we might hope to achieve in the energy efficiency arena, um, apart from some low-hanging fruit and some kind of emergency DIY, won't be in time for next winter. So we have to understand the kind of relationship between the policy challenges that are being faced in an energy crisis, which we are in, which the UK Energy Research Centre has to be very active in the conversation around. So that, that context has really shifted since the net zero strategy was announced um, uh, last year in the run-up to COP. And so we have to be alive to that changing context and the fact that that's having real impacts on people, uh, particularly uh, uh, people on lower incomes, and we need to be thinking about how we should best respond to that. Um, we've got a bunch of policies that are probably uh, an order of magnitude uh, too small in terms of the kind of level of financial support that's offered for, uh, for, for key changes that we're looking for, whether that's in industrial decarbonisation, uh, whether that's in hydrogen, uh, at the moment, we have a complete policy gap for able to pay households um, on the, in, the, in the domestic arena. And we have huge aspirations for heat pumps, but very little of the wherewithal, um, as uh, Richard Hanna, my colleague, was, uh, was talking about in his session um, uh, this morning. Uh, skills gap is a, is a theme that comes, has been coming through um, uh, UKIRP research over many years, and it continues to be skills and supply chain, skills and supply chain. Uh, think about the whole fit picture. Don't just think of a kind of one club golfer kind of approach to policy that if only you can get the magic bullet policy, everything else will fall into place because there's so many different, uh, different aspects uh, of the problem and different things that need to be brought to bear upon it. So the context has completely changed, but net zero has not been thrown out as a result. And that whether to, 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 you know, we've talked a bit about win-wins and we've talked a bit about, uh, you know, acceptance and bringing, bringing people with us. Um, 
in other parts of the world, as I think in the opening session, there was a conversation around uh, coal burn. So we all worry about you know, flying or eating meat or all of the things that you might be able to change as an individual living in a rich country. But if you look at the, kind of the, the global data, uh, most of the CO2 that's emitted in the world is emitted from coal-fired power stations. And those coal-fired power stations predominantly uh, are, are, are operating in producer countries that are making our stuff. Um, and so we need to be thinking about the role that a relatively small, relatively affluent country can play in that context. Uh, in, in pushing for change. Okay, so now I'm just going to run through. This will get a little bit stream of consciousness and possibly slightly disorganised, but it's vaguely chronological. Some, some observations that I've made starting from... Um, starting from so I'm not going to get into the legals of, 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 the, of, a, of a challenge to the, to the net zero strategy because it won't deliver. Yes, there is an implementation gap. So we can just say there is an implementation gap and that's probably justified from the point of view of a campaigning group uh, it should be open to challenge. Just moving on to the first session, thinking about some of the, the context that I picked up from that. Uh, there was, a, uh, I think it was um, uh, Jack was saying about the, 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 the role of, or otherwise, of market fundamentalism. And again, that was, that was echoed by Andy Burnham, who was talking about the importance. Uh, he qualified that by saying, we're not going to try and get the state to do everything. OK, so you need to remember, he's a Blair Brown kind of uh, uh, flavor of labor. So, but he's talking about very, very clear very, very uh, clear leadership um, and direction, a sense of direction, not having stop-start policies. Um, and we have a, a kind of long-running conversation about, you know, markets are very good at some things. Uh, there are different forms of market. Okay, you might have a market for, the, for electricity or you might run an auction uh, to get given a contract uh, for a particular form of generation. And both of those uh, reveal price uh, and both of those have the characteristic of a market but they have completely different time horizons. And what they deliver in terms of infrastructure change uh, is profoundly, uh, profoundly different. Uh, we talked about um, the, the changing narratives, this kind of idea of homegrown uh, being the latest uh, narrative that's, that's grown up around uh, the net zero ag agenda. Uh, we had a very polite debate about nuclear power uh, that I'm sure, as the professional ag agnostic on nuclear power, we will continue, uh, which we will continue to have. Um, <laughs> We got some provocations about our middle class lifestyles and our, um, our five ring stoves and our um, uh, uh, wood burners and various other things, Gillian. Um, uh, well, I'm not going to say, I'm going to make no more comment about. Um, uh, and then we heard, I thought Andy was great. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the contributions that we, that we got from him. Um, I'm just coming now to talk about some of the sessions uh, today. So, uh, really interesting kind of kickoff thing around hydrogen and the role of a potential hydrogen infrastructure. And then we got this kind of dynamic, competitive, integrated market, which I think is a very interesting end point, uh, but it doesn't really tell you how you get to the end point where that's possible, but, which again brings us back to Andy saying very explicitly, market can't do this all by itself. State direction is very much needed. And in the case of network infrastructure, I think that that is almost unequivocally true. Which doesn't mean that it's publicly owned necessarily, but the very, very strong need for a for for, for clear and coherent plans uh, coming jumping around sessions, thinking about the the environmental session that was uh, previous to this one. You know, thinking about some of those trade-offs, I think, is something that very, very interesting and uh, very, very important. That's one of the reasons that we're making infrastructure transformation one of the key themes of our research integration work uh, over the next two years to try and find opportunities. The other, the other key theme will be uh, bringing together resilience and, and energy security that Mike will be leading and we'll be doing some briefing papers on those. So the, the, these are just some of our UKIRK's uh, ne next steps. Um, I'm not going to go on for more than a, another minute or so, but I think there's a, well, some of the other themes that have come through, the need for clear and consistent policy, uh, it was mentioned in the context of heat pumps, as I've, uh, I've, I've already mentioned. We have the very opposite of that in the energy efficiency domain, domain with you know, Green Deal, No Green Deal, uh, Green Homes Grant, No Green Homes Grant, and so on. Um, I, I very, I've already mentioned skills, but I'll mention it again because I think that it's so important and the capabilities and capacities to, uh, to do uh, some of these things. I was, I was very, very struck by the range of estimates that Oliver showed for how much biomass we might or might not need 
uh, in, in order to, uh, to meet our, our net zero aspirations. Um, and I'm, 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 I, we've, we've put a flexible funds topic into the most recent call, which is around land use energy interface. Um, I feel as though we, if I could like rewind the clock, I'd probably do more uh, on bioenergy in this phase than, than, than we've actually been doing. Uh, but the, sort of the whole land use question, and there's a few things there that I thought were really interesting. Um, uh, you know, have we made biomass too, too complicated? Uh, get away from the kind of analysis paralysis? Um, and will all of this come, come through with the biomass strategy? I imagine that the biomass wonks will be disappointed by the biomass strategy. I mean, there's just a, a general, generalised learning. If it's in your sector and you've been thinking about it hard and the government brings out a strategy, you will be disappointed by it. <laughs> That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, monitor, report and verify and the absence of, uh, of policy for, for UK biomass growing were coming from that. Um, so again, we've got an integrating project that's going to be looking at some of these things, but those environmental trade-offs and those societal uh, trade-offs, uh, I think, uh, all need to come through in the work uh, that we're going to be doing. So I'll stop uh, there uh, for now, hand over to some of the other contributors. Look forward to the questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Rob. So uh, we have in addition to Rob, uh, three other panellists this afternoon. Um, the first is uh, Joanne Wade, who is the Chief Strategic Advisor at the Association for Decentralised Energy. She's also an independent consultant uh, with an expertise in local energy systems, energy sufficiency and energy demand reduction. And because of that, she also chairs the research committee for, uh, sorry, the, see, she, Get this right, right, right way round. She's on the advisory board for the Centre for Research of Energy Demand Solutions, CREDS, and she chairs the research committee for UKIRK. So good afternoon, Joanne, uh, and welcome. Uh, another person we have online with us this afternoon is Dara. Um, so Dara Vias from Energy UK. Uh, she's the deputy director at Energy UK and has previous roles, uh, including head of future energy services at Citizens Advice, and Policy and Performance Manager at the London Borough of Brent and Dartford, uh, sorry, and Dartford Borough Council. Um, and she, she will also be uh, joining us online. And the third person who will be joining us is Keith, Keith Bell, um, who holds the Scottish Power Chair in Smart Grids at the University of Strathclyde and is one of UKIRK's co-directors alongside um, Rob. Although he is not representing them here today, he is also a member of the Climate Change Committee, for those of you who didn't know. So uh, uh, an, an, an interesting mix of people. Um, I'm going to ask them each to give us a couple of minutes in response to their views on the net zero strategy, but also any responses that they've got immediately to what Rob has just said. So uh, I'll uh, hand over to Joanne first. OK, thanks, Mike. Um, I have a horrible feeling that I'm a giant floating head in the room, which is a little bit alarming, but, but hey, hi, everybody. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person, um, but you wouldn't thank me for spreading germs. You're not just one floating head, you're three floating heads. <laughs> oh, my God, that's terrifying. OK. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Anyway, um, OK, so I'm going to try and combine a few key things I think are wrong with the net zero strategy with some of the things that I've heard over the last couple of days. Um, but first of all, to acknowledge, as Rob said, you know, we have got a net zero strategy and that is a good thing. So yay. Um, but let's part that for a minute. What's wrong with it? Well, Rob's already mentioned energy efficiency. And I think he said, um, we, we have a, a policy gap for the able to pay. I'd written down, we have a yawning chasm in policy for the able to pay. Um, and I think, you know, Friends of the Earth yesterday identified that um, home heating is one of the areas where the strategy is really vague. And the thing that worries me about it is that if you talk to, say, Treasury, they will say they've got a plan for the able to pay. But the plan seems to be we're going to have a bunch of consultations. Um, well, we've done that quite a few times. And it feels to me like government keep asking the same questions in the hope that they'll get a different answer. And we know what needs to be done, um, but maybe it's still politically unacceptable and we, 
the sector need to figure out how we get over that. Second thing that I think is an issue is governance. In these last two days, I've heard quite a few things that have recognised the importance of local in terms of delivery. Um, and also ta started to talk about whether or not local authorities really understand the boundaries of their role and what they're expected to do. And my feeling from what I heard over the last couple of days is that, no, they don't. And that's very consistent with the conversations I have with local government. They don't really know what's up to them and what shouldn't be up to them. And the strategy really only promises to set clear expectations on how central and local government will work together. Well, A, when are you going to do that? And B, it's a little bit more complicated than just central and local government working together. My third issue is about people. I would say the strategy totally ignores the scope and the scale of the change in lifestyle we need to see. And that is an issue that has come up time after time over the last couple of days. And you know, the strategy talks about we will empower people to make green choices. Well, Gillian said yesterday that people who are excessive consumers think they've done everything green that they can do already. So, you know, where do we go with that? And I think that's a little bit about something that we heard recently today, I think, at the conference about the narratives and about making things consistent with people's values. And I'm I don't think, I think we've got to think a lot more about that. But my biggest, my biggest issue with the whole thing is it has got such a narrow focus. Andy Burnham yesterday talked about seizing the opportunity of leveling up while we deliver net zero. And what really, really bugs me about the net zero strategy, about a lot of the conversations we have about it, is we focus totally on let's deliver net zero at lowest cost. Why, why are we restricting it to that? Why are we not saying let's take the opportunity to transform society as we transition the energy system? If you look at some of the work that some of you guys do, the CREDS positive low energy futures, there's a lot of talk about co-benefits. But then we tend to reduce it down to saying things like, if we take them into account, the cost of transition isn't as high as we thought it was, as opposed to, wow, couldn't we make things a lot better? So that's my biggest beef with the whole thing um and i think there's been a lot of talk about that uh over the last two days i was also at a conference last week the energy efficiency community getting together and i would say very similar messages came out but an extra one which was that we are nowhere in terms of policies and infrastructures that are going to enable or drive the significant changes in our energy service demands in our lifestyles that are going to be needed um rob just said analysis paralysis um, and I think that applies here um, we keep talking about needing to make lifestyle changes we need to try doing a few and see how it goes I'll leave it there that's enough from me Great. Thank you, um, over to Dara thank you um, I will try not to think about being a triple floating head um, and I'll also try to be brief I think you know, there's nothing worse than a panel where everyone agrees with one another, right? And I fear that this might be one of those panels. However, what I will say is that, you know, it does feel as though we've come a long way since the publication of the Net Zero Strategy because we've had COP26, but then we had a massive problem in September, from August, September. We had nearly 30 suppliers going out of business. That's added £2.6 billion to everyone's bills. We've had high global gas prices sent into a cross economy cost of living crisis which shows no signs of going away and um, it's worsened due to the situation in Ukraine and we've had the energy security strategy and now a forthcoming energy bill and the reason I'm saying all of this is not because you all don't know but because I think context right context is everything and the context has changed and I do think on one hand we can be proud that in the UK and, and actually across Europe the response to the gas crisis has mostly been to double down on net zero targets. Um, we know that the simple reason is that energy security goals can really only be achieved through working towards the net zero targets, but there's been a huge gap, hasn't there? The demand reduction and energy efficiency kind of space doesn't seem to be being talked about in the UK enough. The strategy itself and the documents that sit 
below it, within it, after it, consultation, analysis, paralysis, all of that, they do set a broad framework for how to do things. But I think the key challenge with this and with everything, I think, in the energy space is about how we move from ambition to delivery. And I think that actually once we have a better delivery plan from government, it should unlock the investment we need to innovate and do all the things we need to. Um, again, this is an audience to whom I don't need to talk about, you know, the significant progress we've made in the UK on um, greenhouse gas emissions. They're over 47% less than they were in 1990, but the emission reductions have primarily occurred in power and through deindustrialization de and offshoring of some emissions. But, you know, I do think the next stage is just going to be so much more challenging. And it's not just about the harder to abate sectors, road transport, parts of industry. It is that really crucial behavior change in homes as well, isn't it? It's that really tough stuff. And the net zero strategy, you know, it did talk about, you know, demand side changes. It did talk about public engagement. But I think we should also go back to the UK Climate Change Assembly because the last weekend of that was um, the last thing I did before the COVID pandemic. And it was in March and it was a rainy, rainy day in a, in a tower kind of tower block hotel in Birmingham. And it felt sort of end of days in this gale and it took like 12 hours to get home on the, on the train. But it felt so important. It felt so important to be in a room full of regular people who are not involved in this industry who are talking about we need to understand our options we need to know you know where are we getting the information and support we need to make these decisions and that was March 2020 and we are in June 2022 and we have had so many things happen to the country and to the world and we're in the grips of a massive cost of living crisis and if we circle back to that cost of living crisis you know the rollout of low carbon solutions, it does rely on a positive public reception. It does rely on demand and supply, adopting these things, making sure that installation and the supply chain is all set up. We've got installers, we've got the job skills. We have to circle back to cost of living. The world has changed. Focusing on helping people today in the here and now with their bills is absolutely right, but we cannot take our eye off that long-term goal. And I think that's kind of the best place for me to stop right now is actually we all have a duty to keep reminding government about that long-term goal whilst also thinking about the here and now and how to support people because it's the best way I think out of this. Great, thank you Dara. And finally, Keith. Can I stand at this? Of course you can. Thing? Thank you very much. You can. So uh, you've only got one slightly smaller head which is probably good. Um, so now, now, so in the, in the spirit of recalling old jokes from old uh, TV or film comedy, so you know Rob's referring to Monty Python. Now I've got some notes, not necessarily in the right order, uh, relative to what we've been talking about. I think a few old people got that. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, I mean there are some positives I think out of the net zero strategy that, as, as Rob mentioned, you know we kind of think back to whatever you know David Cameron talking about cutting the green crap and all of that, and we think that this is. You know, it still apparently still seems to be a cross-party supported thing. Maybe not within every bit of every party, but, you know, there, there's this sort of apparent consensus that we could, should be somehow building on, if only we could remember it, perhaps. Um, and the debt zero strategy does cover a lot. It does broadly, I think, you know, align or accept the credibility and the usefulness of the CCC's balanced pathway as a guide to policy and the sort of sort of outcomes that we might be getting to. And, and you know, that sort of foundation is absolutely necessary, I think. It doesn't have to be exactly that pathway, but establishing that this is the kind of direction we need to go in and the credibility of it. And but I think I'm you know it's again a kind of outbreak of violent agreement among the panelists, which is always quite boring. Uh, you know, I think for me the detail was always kind of lacking actually of how we're going to do it and what are the steps that need to be put in place now to get there. So absolutely, the focus now is on, is on delivery. Uh, and, and there's just not enough in there. I think, you know, Kirsty put it in one of the, in the infrastructure session this morning about, you know, investors looking for the granular detail and, you know, what are the conditions for scaling up in so many aspects of, of the transition of, of the energy system. And then, you know, the, the, the biomass session reminded us that it's not only about the energy system as such, you know, the whole bigger picture of sort of land use and whatever. 
Uh, so for me, since I've been on the CCC, that's been one of the biggest learning areas, and I'm still incredibly ignorant on it, is all that stuff around land use. So I need to go and get some tutorials you know, from colleagues who know about some of that sort of stuff. And again, you know, agreeing with what's already been said, I think the big piece that's missing is, yes, OK, some woolly words about the demand side, but not much about how, about how to do it. Uh, but, but then the how is, is, is really difficult. And it's a session that we just had uh, on you know, re reducing demand. I, th I think it was really interesting here, especially what, what Maria was saying there, of, of um, you know, looking, having to look at things from different perspectives and the perspectives of, of policymakers who are trying to put these things in, into practice. Um, and, and this is where, again, the kind of the fact of cross, or the yeah, still continued fact of cross-party support seems to be really important. There surely is common ground there to kind of build policy support. Um, that lack of policy detail, I think, um, it's very hard to, to, to engage with. It's hard, I think it's hard for civil servants to engage with. You know, I have various conversations with, with civil servants. I think it's hard for a lot of us, as, as you know, I speak as one, academics to engage with. There's a lot of knotty detail that doesn't exist in textbooks. A lot of it doesn't exist in academic papers either. And you know, it seems that we're often making a bit of a choice about how we kind of concentrate our time as, OK, again, I'm speaking personally, as academics on we're going to just publish some st stuff in an academic journal that's got to appeal to a reviewer who's sitting on the other side of the world and is interested in uh, some sort of methodological novelty, or are we going to publish stuff that is going to change implementation back here, you know, or, or globally, you know, because the ideas can be can be adopted and, and translated. I think it's quite a challenge to how we concentrate our time, actually. Uh, and it goes deeper than just sort of high-level policy wonkery. Um, I can't read my writing. Uh, what does that say? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, the low-carbon choices bit that I think, you know, I think it was Joe talked about and enabling. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's good, good aspirations. And I think it's right about in, trying to enable low-carbon choices. And it's actually not just about individuals and I think households and whatever. It's also about businesses who are also, in a sense, consumers, users of, of services, users of energy. So they also need to be enabled because then the services that they trade on and sell to, to the rest of us. So there's a whole different layers of the sort of value chain or supply chain as well. And then the constraints that, that you know, Rob, I think, and others mentioned, you know, skills and supply chain you know, really need, need to be tackled. And it's, again, it's a sort of societal level challenge, I think. So why aren't the politicians or the policymakers informing them? Maybe they are, maybe the policy, maybe the civil servants sitting in the background are engaging with this and the policymakers, the politicians are not quite grasping it. Why aren't they grasping it? Is it out of some kind of fear? Fear of what? Well, okay, fear of the electorate is one obvious thing. Um, I think there's a point that I think it's Patricia made the point in the biomass session. I think if I understood it correctly, something around um, perfection, seeking perfection in some of our policies against the background of a lot of uncertainty. You know, some of the costs of the different measures are still remain very uncertain. And we're not going to eliminate completely all of that uncertainty. We'll try to reduce it through research, for example, but it, it isn't going to go away. And uh, so that maybe leads to two things, I think. There's a lot, we have a lot of talk about low regrets, investments, or actions. Firstly, that's not no regrets. There seems to be that, and sometimes a lack of willingness to accept that some things we are going to regret. We are going to get some things wrong. So maybe there's a fear among policymakers of that, of not willing to take the risk of getting things wrong. Maybe some of us commentating on it need to accept that as well. If the rationale seems reasonable, given the information available at the time, maybe we need a bit of sort of forgiveness, in a sense, to policymakers. I mean, that's a bit of a challenge about the rationale being sensible at the moment. But anyway, we we'll, we'll can discuss that over a coffee. Um, someone else talked about, I think, I think it might have been Kirsty again this morning, getting the right people in the room and let them get on with it. I mean, I can see the attraction of that, you know, to sort of try and resolve, get, get, get through a lot of the noise. But then, yeah, we're probably all going to disagree about who the right people are to put in the room. I mean, I've got a lot of us who think it should be, well, one of them's got to be me, you know, or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, I think another thing as well, about, you know, I think um, resilience. I think uh, Gillian made the point, I think, at the end of one of the last sessions, is there an opportunity coming out of the whole world? We're not even out of the pandemic, really, yet, are we? Yeah, we kind of might forget that. But the kind of challenge that's been presented to the whole of society, does that represent an opportunity to rethink how we go about things and, and, the, and the kind of importance of resilience? 
I'd like to agree with that. I think it is a really important point. It should be an opportunity, but I just kind of worry about our ability to compute, to understand major threats, and also that our memories are very short. You know, I'm trying to think back to what it was like in March 2020, and I'm not sure any... Well, I don't know, speak for myself again. Did many people really understand the significance of the threat that we were facing? Many people in the UK, perhaps in other countries, they understood it a lot more quickly than we did. And, and, and then us, as, uh, many of us in the room are academics, putting our own house in order as well. I think Alice, in the, uh, again, another session just before the coffee break, some really significant challenges of you know, what, what we do as academics and, and you know, how many air miles we, we use and how you know, big professors don't like being told what to do. And that speaks to some of the kind of values questions as well. A lot of people don't like being told what to do. Uh, so how are we going to encourage everybody, uh, uh, uncover the core values that I think really are there, about resolving these, these uh, challenges and moving forward. And Mike's looking at me like, shut up, Keith, and let everybody come in and ask questions. So, um, <laughs> yeah, mate, this lack of confidence, I think, in making, these, the, making the case for the things that we need to do, is that due to fear, like I say, fear of making mistakes, or is it about kind of lack of government bandwidth, or is it lack of being able to navigate through the noise? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. So I'm supposed to be kind of talking about positive things. That's not quite so positive but maybe it gives some roots to thinking about how we answer them. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you, Keith. Okay, so as we have been doing for the whole of the conference... Yeah, 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 yeah. come sit up front and Rob, please. Um, and, uh, and Dara and Joanne are both on the screen. You're, you're only in two floating places now. <laughs> um, so, uh, as we've... As we've uh, um, been doing it for the whole of the conference. The questions for this afternoon, I'm afraid, are going to have to come through Glissa because it then allows everyone online to participate as well. Um, I have Jan Webb uh, is down the front here, one of the other co-directors of UKIRK, who's just giving me a hand with this to make sure that I don't miss the really important ones that come through. Um, but I thought it'd be good to start with a question, and I was going to start with a question asking the panel what had pleased them about the Net Zero strategy. Uh, I think we've sort of heard an answer from them that, well, that there is one. So I'm actually going to turn to one of the questions that's come through, and I'm picking up on a little theme that, that, that Keith had in there. It's one that I've been pushing quite a lot recently as well. We've got to get on and do some stuff, and we've got to just sort of make decisions and then deal with the consequences of that. But I think there's a big risk in there. And uh, so the, I think the, 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 the risk is the backlash from people when things go wrong. We already see that in, in a lot of political areas. So how much of an impact could right-wing political challenge have on future net zero strategy, given, for instance, their impact on Brexit? So that's where I'd like us to start. God, you didn't put this in the briefing, Mike. No, I didn't. <laughs> I've changed my mind. Oh. <laughs> Having seen the questions come in, so... Uh, Rob, would you like to go first with that Well one? done, Mike. Point it towards Rob. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, so first of all, I think that, you know, what, what we like to do uh, at UKIRK uh, whenever we can is to make sure that our, our answers are fully evidenced. All right. So I am going to preface what I'm about to say with the fact that this is not an evidenced <laughs> answer because uh, that's a question really that you need to be in the domain of, of, of political science, I think, to have a, an informed view of. And I think um, what, what we've seen in, in the UK and in the States and in a number of countries around the world, um, you know, various manifestations of, of populism uh, and, uh, and various kind of features of populism. So there's a kind of culture war conversation uh, that is really significant in the United States, you know, literally uh, a nation divided unto itself at the moment with uh, people holding you know, very, very profoundly different views that stray into the, into the climate space, right? Because, because I'm a really geeky nerd, I was watching a Top Gear Extra on YouTube where there was a guy driving around in a new electric pickup truck that Ford have just launched, and he took it to some kind of cars and bands and beer festival in Texas uh, to, to get opinions of what these people thought about it. And as, and as you could imagine, there were a number of people there that were saying that, you know, um, after he told them you know, it went 0 to 60 in 4.2 seconds and, and could, pull a, could pull a boat, uh, but they still felt that Biden uh, was pushing them 
into uh, something they didn't want. Uh, um, and, and there's a clear kind of sense of, of division around that. And, so, and there's different bits and strands of the kind of populist agenda. Um, it's interesting, I'll put it like that, 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 that Farage clearly thought that there was an opportunity for um, attention to him uh, around the kind of the carbon agenda. Uh, and he aligned that with things like, you know, no new coal mines and um, uh, extraction of North Sea oil and gas and shale gas. And that net zero was kind of daft and silly, kind of, you know, liberal green something rather than we should have a referendum about it. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is that that has been swerved. And this is why, you know, to return to, to one of my kind of comments right at the beginning, uh, that has been swerved for now by the Johnson administration. And one of the consequences of doing that swerving is that you get relatively weak implementation policies because they are concerned that, that, uh, that not having relatively weak implementation policies will play into the hands of, of the kind of Farage end of the conversation. Um, and I just think that's the political reality that we are in, but I'm not a political scientist. Uh, that's just my kind of thoughts and perceptions uh, of, of, of the current situation. And it's not just in the UK and the US, it's, it's, it's written across you know, most, most of the Western world. It's in Australia and it's in France, Germany, and even in Scandinavia, there's elements of this. It's just which bits of what go into this kind of populist agenda. Thanks, Rob. So I'm going to turn that question now to Joanne, but I'm going to add to it. Um, because there's another question that's come in. A sense of fairness is important to public acceptance of change. Does the net zero strategy do enough to promote that? And I think that picks up on one of the themes you said in, in your, uh, uh, what, you, what you said at the beginning as well, Joanne. So sort of picking up on that, that right wing challenge, but also this issue of sense of fairness. Yeah, I think uh, they do go together um, in a strange sort of way. So I think this links to the point I made about changing the narrative from being, oh, let's try and do this at lowest possible cost to this is something that's good for everybody. Um, it's quite hard for anybody politically to argue with something that everybody agrees is a good idea. I mean, I know they'll try, you know, Daily Mail can do anything. Um, but if we persist in appealing to logic, which we as a community tend to do, um, then I think Rob's right. We really risk a complete watering down of implementation policies and therefore missing our target. Um, I think we also risk not maximising the benefits to society as a whole. Um, if we instead um, get a bit more emotional about it, actually appeal to people's emotional side about this um, and talk about making the UK, if you like, UK PLC, a better place for everybody, I think we'll get a lot further because people do like things to be fair, but there's a limit to that. Even if they see, I think it was Gillian was saying, um, you know, something can be seen as the fairest way to do something, but still something that everybody hates. So it's not the only answer. Uh, but I, I do think, I do think using our logical numbers based look it's obvious this is the best thing to do approach that we that we tend to fall back on is the way that we play into the um the challenge whereas if we turn it into something a bit more emotional um we maybe swerve it okay thanks joanne okay so i'm going to go on to dara now but dara i'm going to change the question slightly because there's another one that's come in that's follows on nicely from what joanne's just said so um the net zero transition requires us to be the first generation to value a future generation over ourselves. Do you think this is either true or possible? Oh, that's an excellent question. I think that it is possible to do both. Thinking very much about energy in the home, I think that, you know, 
reflecting on the point about fairness and, and an emotional response, I'd almost take it the other way and talk about what's the most practical and practicable response, because actually one of the things that this cost of living crisis um, and, you know, everything associated with what's happening right now with bills and energy bills has really displayed is that energy is still seen and felt by many people to be and it absolutely is an essential service but people also talk about it and feel as though it's a public good don't they and that is really interesting space i think for for energy companies to be um given you know conversations that are happening about um why can't energy retail companies you know do more to help well most of them haven't made a profit since before the pandemic what about windfall tax on energy generators you know there's a lot of emotion there i think but on that um you know is it about current or future consumers actually you know what people should want and need well need and should want today is a warm safe comfortable home and the low carbon transition we should all be thinking about a future energy market that's inclusive that it's accessible that it does recognize that essential service nature of energy that it isn't just a commodity or a, or a good in any like like a lot of other consumer goods but that the transition itself ought to be facilitating and encouraging innovation and it should always treat everybody fairly and that's something that the energy market doesn't necessarily do right now so if we've got our eye on that as a prize for future generations we ought to be thinking about what we can do today to make things better for people and that does involve things like treating people well but it also you know is about thinking about what can you give people access to how do you make sure that it's not just the wealthiest who benefit from things like access to evs or you know solar panels and things like that and i do think there's an awful lot of good work out there um on that i think there's lots of interesting and innovative projects and programs i think the difference is there's nothing that knits it together there's no national narrative that is telling everybody this is the sort of country we want to be fair enough there's lots of ambition but those building blocks those steps they're what we're missing and actually once you have those building blocks and steps in place that's when you encourage investment in this country that's when you can say actually this investment will unlock this innovation and that will make life better for everybody um so I do think it's sort of iterative and yes of course we ought to be thinking about future generations but that doesn't mean that we leave everybody who's around today out out dry you know it is about actually how do we do this in an iterative way and how do we make sure the low carbon transition in this country is um is is just is fair takes people with with it with them on the journey I just genuinely I think anybody who works in this space is a little bit frustrated really because I think we all know where we want to get to there's lots of ways to get there and government does need to be more decisive really okay thanks Tara well that probably brings me on then to the question that's been most upvoted so far on Glissa and uh, it's a, a a question that's premised on the on the point that uh, were we not all shocked by the government announcing a 25 percent uh growth in nuclear without any explanation so that's the premise of the question and the question to you all as a panel and i'm going to turn to i'm going to turn to keith first keith and rob as as representatives of the ukirk how can the strategy and conclusions of ukirk influence government policy and be made known to the politicians and the public so just from your perspective as 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 co-directors um, director and co-director of ukirk first i think i think our role is to inform policy if it ends up influencing it that will be as a result of a kind of political deliberation and judgment i mean politicians are elected to make judgment in the end on our behalf uh, i think i think my, i feel that my job as a as a researcher is, is to provide yeah, information to those things. Because there are values at play, there are competing priorities. Uh, there, there is, a, as we've talked about, there's a need to sort of, if you like, sell a particular policy uh, to, to different constituencies, different, different groups. Uh, that's, that's their job, you know, is to kind of reconcile those competing interests, find, 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 yeah, find a way forward that, that is gonna be politically acceptable, that's acceptable in the, in, in the minds of everyone in, in society, or at least those who go out and vote. 
Uh, so yeah, so I, I, would, I, make a, I make a slight distinction between inform and influence. Influence, it might end up influencing, but I think the first goal is to, is to inform. And then, yeah, the other bit of it was, because, well, how, how do we do that? How do we get best communicate it? And, uh, and I think that's through sort of, for me, it's a through sort of patient engagement. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we can publish things in academic journals, but they're not always easy to find. You know, they're hidden behind, you know, publishers, paywalls, and, and stuff like that. The thi I think the things that we tried to do in UKIRK, OK, it's a bit, a bit congratulatory of Rob and Elrith in here, you know, publishing blogs and working papers and so on, I think that's really important to try to make things a bit, a bit more accessible, even though they don't seem to get the same kind of academic credit. You know, they don't go necessarily in the same position on your CV when you're having your annual appraisal or in, in the research excellence framework, but I think they're really important. Now, I'm looking here to one or two policy-making colleagues to see whether I'm talking sense or not, because uh, I'm really interested to get, get views from the other side. You know, what, what, what's lacking in the way that we are communicating things in initiatives like UKIRK. UKIRK isn't the only one. There's other kind of partner things going on, CREDS, we, you know, have, and, and SESI, and, and Climate Exchange in Scotland, and, and whatever. But that, yeah, that, those are the sorts of things that... And, and, and the discussion. I mean, events like this is... I mean, it's, it's kind of tricky to so try to enable people to join this online. We have to do that. And we see the, the benefit of it, hearing from Joe and Dara you know, right now and putting all these questions online. It's a bit frustrating when the glister thing doesn't seem to work. So in that last session, I tried asking the same question three times and none of it seemed to get through. And it wasn't just because Gillian was ignoring it. I don't think it was anyway. I just don't think it went in. It just didn't go into the system. It wasn't voted up. Was it? Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> it was a really, it was obviously a great That's question. why I'm not a politician, because I don't know how to get voted up. Um, I, I have to say, I'm not following Gillian's approach. I'm not just going for the ones who get voted up. But anyway, uh, Rob. Yeah, I mean, it's quite, so I take a slightly historical perspective on it from the point of view of the history of, the, of UKIRK and the kind of development of, of what's now ended up being a net zero strategy. So... One of the first things that UKIRK set out to do when Jim Ski was in charge back in the mid-2000s was, was it was part of a conversation to demonstrate that what was then an aspirational 60% uh, reduction was, was, was doable. So we, we were in a conversation where a bunch of modelling was done using modelling tools that are still in the consortium now. Uh, and uh, judgments and assumptions were made. We weren't the only, only group doing this, but we were among, amongst a relatively small number of groups that were... We're doing this kind of work and I think quite comprehensively demonstrated that that kind of scale of reduction was, was achievable. And that was politically important. I think we also played a role, in, in, for example, in showing, uh, demonstrating some things to be much less of a problem than some at the time were arguing them to be. And so I'll point you to the intermittency report that we produced back in uh, 2006, 2007. When again, you know, we, nuclear was in the was in the conversation at that time. When wind and so, uh, solar was not was not non-existent really, wind was in its infancy, and there was a conversation that roughly ran along the lines that if we had more than about ten percent of electricity from variable renewables, the lights would go out. Okay, which was false, uh, but it was a very contested argument at the time that UKIRK was able to make an evidence-based contribution to by doing a very, very thorough systematic review and bringing together uh, protagonists from all sides of the debate. And of course, you know, uh, the, the Jim Ski and Dennis Anderson when he was alive and others couldn't help but get involved with their own modelling from first principles to make sure uh, that, and work the whole thing out. So there are a number of examples like that where UKIRK has made quite a profound contribution by contributing um, to the evidence base. We did something quite similar with, with the potential for biomass. I remember, I don't know if Raf Slade is still here, but he contributed to that. We've done stuff on green jobs. Um, and um, right now, you know, we've done this idea that we've popped into the discourse around, well, what if you got all your nukes and renewables onto a CFD contract, how much money could you save next winter? Um, and that's got attention from the very highest levels of government. But not from the Times, unfortunately. They keep quoting somebody else. Yeah, well, <laughs> we can't always, we can't do everything. We, 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 do all right, we do all right on the media side of things. But, but none of that means that the policy-making process is, is, is wholly uh, logical or rational or that we're, you know, always will be listened to. We're not being listened to terribly well in the transport arena, much to Gillian's frustration, uh, for example. Uh, we are amongst many voices, including the industry, 
Dara, um, uh, arguing that there needs to be much better, more comprehensive policies to do supply chain and skills, and particularly in the energy efficiency arena. Okay, Rob. So let's, let's, uh, one let's, last. Oh, go on, then. Go on, then. I'm going to finish because the thing about the the nuclear. I don't. It wasn't a terrible. It wasn't a surprise. Um, and there was a really interesting conversation yesterday uh, um, uh, about nuclear. And as I say, I'm professionally agnostic on nuclear. Um, but clearly, you can also see the interest of lobby groups, uh, the influence of lobby interests in government. So, you know, the narrative around small modular reactors and so on uh, was, was very, very clearly some very, very successful um, kind of um, conversation with government by a relatively small number of, uh, of companies with a, with a product. Thanks, Rob. So, Dara, just picking up on that theme, and, and, and as, a, as a member of the advisory board along, alongside me and others, um, do you think they're doing enough? Could you could be doing more on pushing that policy message, those messages out to those policymakers? Um, I think UK punches above its weight, really. I think that the issues faced when it comes to campaigning and advocacy are actually quite broadly shared amongst all of us. Um, Joanne, ADE, other trade bodies, but also, you know, it's a, it's an interesting and busy space. You know, there's a far more uh, what you describe as energy stakeholders than I think you did 10 years ago when I, or 12 years ago when I started working on energy. And I think that um, that's not a bad thing. I think it's really good to have diversity of views and opinions. Perhaps sometimes we're not diverse enough because we all coalesce around certain ideas. And I think it's, <laughs> You know, they say um, the relationship thing that some people say, you know, it's it's not it's not um, it's not you, it's me. I sort of feel like with government, there is something there around. Actually, this government has been distracted. It has faced numerous crises. Um, there is so much going on right now that isn't necessarily energy or cost of living related, but is very important. I'm thinking things like. Partygate, Sue Gray, you know, PPE scandal, so much has happened. And, and actually, with energy always being in the headlines and constant pivoting, you know, from one thing to another, one day you're talking cost of living crisis, next day you're talking windfall tax. It is actually really difficult for those of us whose day job is to advocate for and on behalf of trying to improve things in this industry or trying to get the right outcomes for consumers or trying to influence policy it's quite different to make sure you're touching that sweet spot at exactly the right time. So I do think UK does do it well. I think we could all always obviously do better and that's why we do our jobs. That's why we are in what we're doing because we want to make things better for people or at least that's, that's why I do what I do. Um, but I think, I think there is something about how we get better at doing a couple of things. One of those is partnership working, um, leaning on one another more. And, and capitalizing on being able to share resources and be more efficient where we have the same or similar calls or we want the same or similar outcomes. Um, and the other is timing. And actually timing is always going to be hard, but I do think there is something around trying to hit the sweet spot when we're trying to influence. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, blunt responses, I think you do all right, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks, Tara. So, uh... Joanne, um, I'm going to slightly change the question again here because there's another one come in, uh, which is asking, and, and this really comes to you as, as chair of the research committee, is asking whether UCOOK should be doing more research on policy making and, and, and how these things land with the policy makers. Okay, good question. Well, I'm, I'm just going to circle back to Keith's original answer to the previous question and actually push back slightly and say, I think as researchers, you actually have a duty to try and influence policy. If you know some facts that aren't getting out there, then you should be trying to make those facts count. I do actually think you could, does a fairly good job of it. Like Dara said, I agree with her. Um, should we be doing more research on policymaking? Um, I think possibly yes, because we, back in my original comments this afternoon, I said 
government keeps asking the same question and hoping to get a different answer on energy efficiency. So we are collectively doing something wrong in terms of how we're communicating what the answer is. And none of us seem to be able to work out what it is. So that's a need for research. Um, how do we convince better when we are pretty sure we know what the answer is? How do we, as was said earlier today, how do we make our messages consistent with the values of the politicians that are in power? How do we make them see that it's something that they can sign up to? Um, now, I'm sure there's an awful lot of political science out there that already thinks about this, and I want Jan to answer this question, not me. Um, but, but maybe we need something that's about enhancing our impact. It's not a major strand of research, but something about communicating in ways that do influence rather than just inform. Great, thanks, Joanne. So there's a, a question that's had three votes, um, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, it sort of goes back almost to the first presentation yesterday um, from Friends of the Earth around, around the court case, uh, where their sort of contention was 95% is all that's covered in the explanations we're getting from government around what the net zero strategy is going to deliver. So this question asks, do we have to do net zero or would a much easier net 90%, not even 95%, 90% be good enough? Yes and no. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, say that again, Keith. 90%, is that which way round was it? Uh, Maybe I've got the answers the wrong way around. Would, would a net 90% be good enough? No. Right. Would it be easier? Yes. Would it be easier? Yes, it would be easier. I mean, by almost, you know, by definition. I mean, there was a lot, there's a lot of thought has gone into, you know, I'm slightly putting a CCC hat on now, but gone into the net zero recommendation. It had to be taken in an international context and in the context of what, could be judged to be feasible to be delivered in the UK. Uh, so, and that's part of the act, I think, is to think about the sort of economic circumstances and implications of, of carbon budgets and, and emissions reduction targets. So, yeah, a lot of the analysis was trying to establish, yes, it is, it, it is, should be deliverable. The economic consequences, you know, we had a session on the economics yesterday and you heard Mike Thompson talking about, well, you know, 0.5% of GDP, 1% of GDP, <laughs> the ways in which we might have got those estimates wrong, on which side, the upside or the downside. By the way, I thought Paul Eakins hit the nail right on the head in that session when he talked about risk. And a lot of this being about you know, the nature of risk and upside and downside, and which kinds of judgments uh, have, you know, what, and what kind of upside is, is related to which kind of judgment. So, you know, if we, if we get the impacts on the climate wrong, well, you know, if it goes the wrong way, that's just massive, it's just huge, it's inconceivable. Um, if it turns out to be more benign than we thought, well, okay. Uh, if we get the costs, cost estimates slightly wrong, well, it costs us money and there's, there are implications for individuals, not just for this amorphous thing called the economy, but it's kind of not as catastrophic as the failure to deal with, with climate change. So the deliverability is one thing, and then the international context, our obligations under the Paris uh, Agreement, and also a bit of history. I mean, was something you asked the question about history earlier. Is there, another, is there a generation that has looked to the next generation when you, I don't know, maybe you could argue that the, the, the people who went and fought in the Second World War, you know, faced death on a daily basis, did it for what they believed would be the kind of environment in which they wanted their kids to be brought up. And then also when they came home, they voted in quite a radical government that also kind of, okay, building on, you know, beverage report and whatever that came out during the war or pre-war, you know, to try and reform a lot of how we shape society as well. So. So there has been, I think there are precedents for those kinds of judgments of doing things in a kind of slightly selfless way in favor of, of uh, you know, the, the younger generation. And part of that historical legacy is what, is what we've ex you know, made, taken advantage of uh, as being in, in the kind of vanguard of the industrial revolution, us and other industrialized economies. It's very difficult to get the balance right. There's always gonna be arguments about that. And really, again, one of the sessions yesterday, really important points about uh, different impacts in, across different countries, as well as then within different sort of social strata within individual countries, and, and who the winners and losers are. 
So as a kind of at a sort of individual and family level, I think we can easily value the younger generation. But when it comes to winners and losers across society, it's much harder to get that consensus, and even harder on an international scale. So what was the question again? Can I add to Rob? I just yeah, a, a, a very brief uh, uh, answer. I think um, I, I can't. The, the net zero target exists. It's in the Climate Change Act. It's in legislation. Uh, we could obviously have a detailed conversation about different dimensions of it, so different sector contributions. Uh, we, we, we might find that we're in a conversation about whether we, whether we think that the um, electricity sector can go to net zero or net negative as quickly as some of the analysis uh, suggests. That's just an example. I don't want to open a discussion about that. Um, but I... I would, just from a purely practical point of view, I would struggle to see the point of UKIRK going into bat against a net zero target that has already been agreed and is in legislation. You know, why would that be, how would that be a helpful contribution for us to be making? I think it's far uh, more constructive to take it as the context within which we work and then work on you know, what's required in order to achieve that, what will be difficult, where are the, evid where are the evidence gaps, what are the policy needs, and then, you know, coming back to the, um, the question, the homework question for the session is, is the net zero strategy good enough or something like that? So we have a target. Rather than unasking whether we should have a target, we should be talking about the, and we are, talking about the, the, means, to, uh, the means to deliver it. And that just seems to me to be kind of pragmatic and sensible. OK, so on to that means to deliver it then. Um, I've got a question here that really, I think, needs to go to Joanne and, and Dara. What role does behaviour change play in closing the implementation gap versus technology? And, and what are the main challenges here? So it's not, uh, not just what's the, what's the role, but what are the challenges with that? With that uh, behaviour change, and I, and, I, and I guess I'd like to extend that to not being just about behaviour change, but social practices more broadly. Five minutes. Who do you want to go first, minutes. Mike? Um, why don't you go first, Joanne, and then, and then over to Dara. OK, well, I take exception to the idea of behaviour change versus technology. We're all part of the same system. <laughs> it's about how we use technology. Um, so it's not a versus. They're both needed. Um, and in terms of practical solutions, um, just, just one thing for me, start with people's homes, explain to them that what we're trying to do is give them a warm, comfortable, really nice place to live and tell them how to do it. Don't tell them what to do, explain to them their options. But it's, it, that's the thing that delivers carbon emissions reductions and makes life better for everybody. So why don't we start there? Great, thank you. Dara? Yeah, yeah, I think I think John's right. I think there's one thing I'd add to that. There is the um, there's behaviour change, there's technology, but you um, do have to make this stuff accessible. And right now, it's really not user friendly to try and do anything, make any changes to your home. Um, you know, it's not new news that we need to do three things. We need to make our homes more energy efficient because the cheapest energy is the energy you don't use. Um, we need to get back to a world where there are, you know, smart tariffs. We don't have many options when it comes to tariffs. We, we need to change people's relationship with energy in the home, moving from a market that's predicated on switching as the only way in which we engage with our energy and our energy supplier and moving towards a more, you know, without sounding naff, a kind of deeper, more meaningful relationship between energy companies and people where you are thinking about bundled tariffs and tailored services. And, you know, as long as the consumer protections are right and in place so that people aren't being treated badly and that they're not suffering as a result of it, actually having a more meaningful, arguably more complex, but an easier interface with your energy company should be, should be what we're looking for. So there's that kind of energy efficiency. There's the stuff in your home, the smart tariffs, the products and services to make do things easy since the technology, but it's also decarbonizing the heat in your home, the way we heat our homes. And those three things all have to happen within the same sort of time frame. And right now, the process is not easy at all. 
um, making that even just knowing what your options are, knowing what the right size of whatever it is you need to do for your home, what order you do things in. There's too many rogue traders. You know, we talk, we've, you know, we within context like um, UK and the work you all do. There's a lot of conversation about installer you know, readiness and availability and jobs and skills, but actually. This is an area that's you know, rife with consumer problems. There are far too many um, cowboy traders. There's far too much scamming in this space. And, I, and you know, all it takes is for one person to have a bad experience and then to talk to some of their neighbors and friends and family. And that is, you know, it's not what we want. And we ought to be thinking about fixing those glitches in that journey that people go on from making, you know, from, from fi trying to find out what's right to making a decision about it, to having it installed, to using it, and then to end of life or changing or changing supply or changing product, that all needs to be a lot simpler because otherwise we're not gonna take people with us. So it's not just behavior change or technology, it's that entire wraparound um, journey that people have to go on. Um, and right now it's just far too complicated. It's complicated, it's scary. You don't know where to go when things go wrong. So, you know, these are things that I think they theoretically should appeal to this government. They're about getting through, cutting through some of the this far too much conflicting um, red tape and regulation in this space. So I'm not saying get rid of it by no means. I'm saying simplify it, make it easier to understand. Great. And uh, thank you, Dara. Um, I think that's a great way to finish that uh, debate. So the, uh, excellent input there. Thank you to all four of you. Maybe we can just give them a round of applause. I'm going to hand over to Rob to uh, close the conference. Great. Um, uh, that was really, really well chaired. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much to all of you and, and, and to Mike. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna close really um, by 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 saying how I was extremely sceptical about our capacity uh, to organise this conference in hybrid format in the time that we, al we allocated ourselves when we decided that we'd start doing it a relatively uh, uh, short few uh, months ago. And I'm really, really pleased to say that I was wrong. Um, and I, I'm also very, very, very pleased to be able to say that I had almost nothing to do with organising this, because that allows me to say that what a terrific success um, it has been, and I'm, I'm, I think I mean, I, I haven't obviously been sitting on a laptop looking at what it looks, feels like if you're online, uh, but this thing here with the, with the iPad seems to work, and thank you to the people at the back of the room with, the, with all the gadgets uh, making this all work for us. Um, and it, it isn't easy to make a hybrid conference work. Uh, we saw that, how difficult it was with the first uh, sort of experience I had of that, which was the British Institute of Economics conference in Oxford last uh, autumn. So first of all, P Paul, do you want to just come up? Because I just want to thank you as conference chair um, and all of the all of the conference, uh, the, all of the kind of session leads uh, and all of the uh, all of the presenters. So can we give the academic people a round of applause? First of all, please. Um, and, and Paul and I would also now like to thank the the admin HQ people. I'm not going to embarrass them by making them come up and stand up and walk up to the front of the room. Uh, I have uh, a little bag of very, very imaginative uh, gifts that look a little bit like they're shaped like wine bottles. Uh, for um, So Kaiser, our operations manager, has, uh, has, has had to go already, so I've given her hers. Uh, but I'd like to thank uh, Jessica. Do you want to like wave and, uh, at the front? Who's our comms manager? Uh, and hiding at the back, trying not to get noticed, we've got uh, Diana, who's taken care of you know so many different aspects of the logistics. Thank you very much. And and Connor uh, for being Connor. And uh, we've also got uh, Amber and Gaia and, and Joanna, the, the rest of the HQ team here as well. And it's, it is a very much a collective effort, but I did just want to particularly uh, highlight who's put in above and beyond the work uh, that was required in order to make this uh, uh, such a success. 
And that is it. Thank you very much indeed for coming. <laughs>